Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Sleeping Dogs. Today I am going to continue to ignore the plot, and do all of the side missions and favors and such that have appeared in between the wedding and the next story mission. Also, you can see by the mini-map that there is the conclusion to the, uh, the second police case as well. Anyway, since I'm helping the townsfolk, I decided to go with a particularly familiar outfit. Even though Tony Jaw doesn't actually wear this for more than like a couple seconds. That was just for fun. Gotta keep the guy who's uh, tallying all of my crimes on his toes. That's right. Lots of motorcycles in Ongbok 2. Well, not Ongbok 2, because Ongbok 2 is a historical piece for some reason. But in the on original Ongbok, there are a lot of motorcycles. Alright, my first favor. What you need? Hey, hey, what's going on? I think a poke guy be moving in on my girl. The problem is, this guy's connected with some big shots. Otherwise, I would just fucking kill him. He hangs out by the bus depot, doing all kinds of illegal shit. I figure... If the cops happen to be there, you would have other things to worry about than my girl. Sure, why not? All right. So we got to get some police attention. Luckily, they put these cops right here. Yep, not going to do that. And I did assault an officer, so they go straight to two, like most uh, most open world crime games of this nature. Luckily, that means they will uh, they'll stay on my tail better. Hey there, guys! Hope you're not doing something too illegal. And that's not an exit. Not an exit at all. Okay. Time to go out through the lion's mouth. But hey, cops are more worried about the people firing back, so... I get off scot-free. Alright, looks like there's another one in the alleyway where the fight club is. It's close enough that I don't feel like cutting this out. Alright, I think those double doors up there are how you get into the alley. Yeah, sure enough. Alright, let's see what this is about. What do you need? I need a favor. I was supposed to collect some protection money from these vendors an hour ago. The bastards called the cops for protection. Can you distract them? All right. I'll see if I can draw them off. Never really threw anything before. Hey, you! And the stupid unicorn. Oh. <laughs> I, I left shall. An interesting way of putting it, but yeah, you're not supposed to jump down there. But yeah, like, y you can kill people by uh, throwing knives at them, but it never really occurs to me to do so. I mean, I, I suppose part of the problem is that this is your first indication that you can throw weapons at people. It's... A favor buried at least a third of the way through the game. Yeah, that was a dead end, but luckily it, uh, the cops were far enough behind me. Oh, hey guys. Luckily, I still remember that quick time event. Oh, 
All right. Least attention is gone. Favor complete. Oh, and there's a parking garage right here. Let's see, what else do we have? Something over in Kennedy. Cheaters ne never prosper three. That sounds familiar. Alright, which motorcycle was it? This is the one. Alright, but you don't want to see the drive over, do you? I didn't think so. Oh, another motorcycle. I think it's the same mo- it is the same model. Huh. Wait! Wait! What do you want? I got cheated again. No break Cho was losing to me, but he had a friend run me off the road. Guy was driving a big truck. He almost killed me. Will you help me? Someone needs to straighten him out. Again? You sure you didn't just lose? I swear. Okay. And you're sure the truck driver was affiliated with your opponent, and not just a truck driver who did not realize that there were people illegally racing down the roads on his route. Okay, let... Okay, I'm glad I checked the map here, because that's bullshit. Right, I'm, I'm turning left right here and getting on the highway. Alright, here we go. <clears throat> there. Cut off like half a mile off of my route. Man, this GPS. I suppose part of the problem is that I actually took an off-ramp to get on here. What the hell? Where were you going? Right. Yeah, I'm not going to make two turns when I can only make one. Damn GPS. All right, he, no, wait, it's not here. I just remembered. Once again, the GPS deceives because I need to take the road up here to get to my destination. Now, sadly, I'm in a motorcycle, so I can't just ram the thing to do damage. Luckily, this one is a little different. Son of a bitch. Hey, boys, this is the fucker who's been trashing our cars. You're not seriously going to try something, are you? Are you an idiot? <laughs> You're going to take us all on? Get him! In the fucker! Kill this moron! Okay, the game is not letting me climb into any of these cars, so... I'm just gonna have to beat them up the old-fashioned way. Yeah, sadly, by the way, this, uh, this outfit has no bonuses associated with it. So yeah, if you want the Tai Chi, or not the Tai Chi, the Muay Thai moves, that's what you get. If you want the Muay Thai moves, you need the Muay Thai outfit, which you get from the DLC. It's the same thing that other guy was wearing, for that matter. Yeah, I'm gonna use your face to damage this car. Hang on. Oh, holy shit! <laughs> Hulked out for a second there. Wow! <laughs> Alright, but let's get to damaging the car. I mean, it, it's obvious now that this guy is just spewing complete bullshit. I mean, whether he's aware of it or not, that's still a question, but... You know... We work for a gang... Honesty doesn't really matter for that much. This isn't about justice, this is about connections, you know? Alright, more stuff. Back at the, uh, the temple. This is the thing we skipped before. 
thing I promised we'd do eventually, and uh, here we go. All right, let's get this started. Defeat the monks. Ten monks. Like I've said before, you can grapple, you can strike, but they can counter both types of moves. So your best bet is to, you know, counter them first and when they're off guard, then you use your grapples and your strikes. Also build up your face meter because once it's full, I have enough points in it that, um, well, anything goes once it's active. There, see, he blocked my grapple. But now I'm in face mode, so screw you. Just throw you to the ground. So I can do that too. That didn't really make good use of my face time, I gotta be honest there. And it, he got out of my grapple, too, by the way. Did you notice that? Pulled him up from the ground, and he just went, Nope. You do not get to continue to hold me. And you do not get to attack me. This is, this is why monks are kind of annoying. Yeah, there's only four more to go, though. Looks like there's three on the, uh, the fountain here. Interesting place for a fight. Something about fighting in ankle-deep water is just very, very nice for cinematography. But yeah, you'll notice there, by the way, I, I, I actively grappled that guy and got a few grapple strikes on him. Got to throw him. Got to use the leg breaker, even. That's what's really tricky about them. The monks. The fact that they're inconsistent. Don't get me wrong, I get why, but then I also get why they're not a regular type of enemy. Alright, last... uh-oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the number of monks I need to take out is just keeps going up, but I also get a damage boost. Get to drown that guy, pretty much. Sounds like I didn't kill him because he gasps for air when I pull back out, but still. Yeah. Anything you do to these people will take them out instantly. I guess they violated the uh, conservation of ninjas rule. That's where the uh, one ninja is unstoppable, but an army of a hundred ninjas is easily defeated. Yeah, look at that kill streak build up. I tied with a high score, by the way, 28. And this is the mission you get it on. Looks like I won't be uh, beating my old score this time. Yep, 27. Took too much time with those environmental kills, I think. Well, kills, in quotations. Yeah, of course you get three triangles, but it's negligible experience because instead what you get is that Shaolin Warrior outfit and that one um, Wing Chun dummy. The one I practiced on in the DLC. There's one at the apartment now. Yeah. Only in North Point though, not in all four apartments. Yeah, 
heading over there right now because it's nearby. Figured I'll show it off. All right, let's have a look. Yep, there it is. The practice dummy. Works the same. Works the same as before. And now I don't know what's up with the sound. Really loud at first and then quiet. I did not get that at all. Also, it looks like wood, but it moves like it's actually made out of something softer. Which makes sense. I mean, it's a modern replica, not the original sort of thing. Turns out punching wood a lot is bad for your knuckles. You want to toughen them up, but you don't want to destroy them, you know? Turns out. But yeah. The reason I did all of that specifically was to let you know, and... Oh yeah, there's one more way up here. Hmm. The reason I showed all of that off is to let you know that... The, uh, combat bonuses stack. The dummy bonus doesn't last as long as the energy drink. But it stacks. And they are both free if you start in the, uh... Or even if you just head over to the, um... The North Point apartment. I figured I'd try something new after all that hip-hop. Ah, uh, now what? I look nasty. You okay? Never mind that. You have to help me. What do you need? I get a car like and get us the hell out of here. Mm. That busted one doesn't look right. And I doubt he'd want a motorcycle. Doubt I'd want a motorcycle for what's about to come. By the sound of things. Come on, mate. This is <laughs> oh Jesus! Okay, that one was not my fault. That was somebody else's hit and run. Uh oh. Oh Gaia! That's them! They've seen us! Alright. Yeah, this is why I figured a motorcycle would not be acceptable. Because we need to drive out of 18k territory. What'd you do to piss them off so much? Not much. I stole a few cars and they claimed I was infringing on their turf. So they jumped in and cut this one guy's face to get away. I guess it was the brother of someone important or something. In any case, they're pretty fucking hostile. You better stay out of the territory. You don't say. Yeah, doing the whole um, driving and gunning thing is a little less fun when all you have is a uh, pistol. It's just not as effective. They're gone, right? I think you lost them. Well, kind of. Yeah, they're gone. Thanks, man. You can let me out anywhere suits you. Not gonna. I'm good. Uh, thanks, Way. You saved my ass. Tirikina. All right then. Hmm. The gun is down to one bullet now. But hey, I'm in the right location to find a ship and uh, get to the uh, the favor up north. But of course, that takes way too long every time I do it. So. Here's me cutting to uh, the destination. You know, there are no garages for uh, boats like there are in some of these games. You have to find one every time. And 
Unless you have the speedboat, maneuvering is a real, real bitch. But hey, we're here. And my gun is out, I should put that away. Wait, can you help me out, man? What's the problem? There's some guys running a game around the corner. Morons are going to draw the cops down. Can you get rid of them for me? All right. I really gotta wonder about the state of illegal gambling in Hong Kong. Game's over. It seems like it's all located on boats for technicality purposes. But at the same time, they want to avoid police attention. Which, uh... You know, if they're abiding by the letter of the law, it shouldn't matter. So really, I have no idea what goes, what's going on with this. I mean, of course, I, I could just go look it up, but... Man. A lot of people in there. wonder where they're going. Anyway. Oh my God. This is your other opportunity to gamble. Oh, and here's one of the remaining Jade statues. And a refrigerator. Where you can get a free energy drink. You'll see it refresh the one that was only like an eighth done instead of half. You want a game? Yeah, here's where you can play Mahjong. Beta. Except it's not really Mahjong. It's dice poker with Mahjong tiles. What the hell? They, they don't even use the other suits. They just use the circles. Like I've, I know you can play a lot of games with Mahjong. It's basically um, cards, but with tiles. Ah, oh, damn it! Not your night. You want a game? Yeah, let's keep this going. But yeah, like when people say Mahjong, they mean a game that is sort of like gin rummy. Oh man, sixes to fives. Oh nice, four of a kind. That's a pretty decent payout too. Lucky. You can see there. Yeah, that's enough just to show it off. But yeah, it's uh, but the 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 mahjong game that's basically gin rummy is, it's basically like. How you would think of uh, Five Card Draw or Texas Hold'em when someone just said poker. There's a lot you can do with the tiles. It's just... It's... Dice poker isn't one of them. That's what dice are for. Yeah. I'll do the Jade Statue first. Get that upgrade. Might come in handy. Let's see what the old Sifu has to say. I found one of your statues. A monkey. Thank you. You don't look well, Wei. Is everything all right? No, Sifu. What do you plan to do about it? It is what it is. So if your punches are weak, that means they're destined to be weak? Or is it true that through practice and concentration, you can change? Some problems are harder to solve than a weak punch, Sifu. Watch my students for a minute. You may change your mind. Okay, so he has been berating his students. What would you like to learn? Ooh, stun grapple follow-up. I've been waiting to get a hold of this one. <laughs> 
so much more nasty than just the kick to the face. I mean, I don't think it does more damage. It just... it just feels more painful. Oh, jeez. Apparently you can do knees to the face, too. And that's still the stun grapple follow-up, by the way. Oh man, I wanted to follow up one last time. Oh, and yeah, there's the, uh... There's the cabinets, by the way. They're in the main room. We've been down there once before. I'm not sure if I showed it off or not. Yeah, that's all the favors. One thing left to do, and... Let's get rid of Ace. Or deal with Ace, I should say, since... We are working for the police with this one. Where is this guy? Oh, stop trying to kill me! He's crazy! He's... Shit. All right, and this is how tracing works. You have to get into the center of the triangulation uh, zone for some reason. I mean, normally the target has to be, you know, triangulated and not the person, but I guess it's so that the game knows where you are when you start. Because there's going to be a timer after this, just as soon as I can actually get to the center here. Ah, here we go. There's a fair amount of leeway. There's always a road there, of course. Timer. Hope you got a good car for this part. Luckily, you've also got a lot of time. So even if you've got a terrible car, you also need to be a terrible driver at the same time in order for that, uh, for that time limit to actually hit you. For once, the GPS isn't trying to screw you over. As it turns out, the destination is on the highway, so it doesn't have a choice. It has to tell you where they actually are. Got some real funk on the radio this time. There, see, it's not even halfway over, and I'm here. Oh, jeez. I swear it went over the rails. They didn't change that, by the way. I think there's, uh, orange cones there normally. If nothing else, the game did not bother to animate the, uh, the railings getting destroyed. Gotta make sure the girlfriend's in the picture. I mean, not for the game's sake, just for mine. Luckily, the paramedics are here. 
Yes. Inspector, hotshot killed Ace. Damn it, Wade, we were supposed to catch them in the act. Yeah, well, they acted too fast. I have an eyewitness statement and all the evidence you need to get this bag of shit off the streets. I'll type out a warrant. <laughs> Don't bother. I have a better idea. I'll challenge him to a race, and once we're in it, I'll lead him right to you. All right, but Wei, I want him alive. Oh, hello there. I think I can do that. Mmm. Oh, oh, and uh, look at the vanity uh, license plate. Fast back. It is, too. Uh, listen to that exhaust grumble. Yeah, I'm, I'm driving safely here, not because it, it would ding my police score, but because I don't want to damage this car. Not until I have to, when, I, when the race starts, at least. And that's also why I'm leaving in the drive over, even though I, I could totally just drop it. I just... I want to enjoy this car, and I, I want you guys to enjoy it, too. I mean, I, there are other fast cars, but uh, this one is provided to you for story purposes. And so they they made it a little more special than usual. All right, here we are, Victoria Peak. There's the asshole. No, it, it is especially cheating if you win. Because if you cheat and lose, then you just... If you cheat and you lose, then you suck so hard, it's embarrassing. But if you cheat and win, then you're an asshole. You're a king among assholes. Because the reason the rules exist is so that everybody can have fun. And, uh, if you cheat, then you're the only one having fun. So, uh, fuck you. Anyway, this particular course is full of shortcuts. And I am not supposed to be tapping him. But uh, I just wanted him, and you, the viewers, to know that I totally could have won this race if winning it was my objective. It's not, but I could have won. Yeah, I keep getting my score dinged for tapping him, but... Uh, well, it's fun, for one, and for another, it's an investment. I'm not supposed to knock him out of the race until we hit the, uh... Ah, yeah, until we hit that. But once we do... Yeah, disable Hotshot's car. And... <laughs> I don't think that'll be a problem. Whoops. Nah, he's all right. Okay. <laughs> what? You, you do that, uh, hot buddy. Oh, come on. You, you can't move. You're still gonna go for it. Your engine's on fire, dude. <sighs> Finally. All right, onto the highway. Let's lose this tail. The greatest of ease, my new gray fastback. The big tot shot up. Little punk never shuts up. You should have seen the look on his face when we 
charged him with murder. He'll get 20 years at least. Nobody pays much attention to those guys, but they kill or injure dozens of people a year. Possible to say how many lives you've saved, but you really did a job on this one, Officer Shen. It's Italian too. And hey, hey, last bit of cop experience I needed. This is the wrong tree. Last bit of cop experience I needed. Now I could just find firearms and police trunks. I don't think I got any new um, information, by the way. Well, it looks like there's nothing left but uh, story missions to do. So that's the end of this video. Today's movie is the recommendation of David Kowalczyk. It's Polish, so forgive me if I'm saying that wrong. Anyway, as I alluded to last time, the film is the original source of Martin Scorsese's The Departed, a little Hong Kong crime thriller called Infernal Affairs that came out in 2002. The story about the story. Back when I talked about Flashpoint, I discussed the decline of the Hong Kong movie industry following the boom in the 80s and early 90s. While the industry suffered in terms of size and finances, the quality of the individual films was steadily improving. American audiences had a big appetite for kung fu action in the late 90s and early aughts, and that brought Hong Kong filmmakers, the experts of unarmed action sequences, to Hollywood. As a result of this exchange, American filmmakers learned how to choreograph fights, and Hong Kong directors caught up to the technology and the film techniques of Hollywood. Still, a declining industry is a declining industry. So Infernal Affairs had the interesting timing of being a landmark film that came out at a, pretty much the lowest point for Hong Kong cinema. The movie was an original idea directed by Andrew Lau and Alan Mack. Lau's career started during the boom as a cinematographer, working for a then-slumping Shaw Brothers Studios. As time went on, he moved into the director's seat and even started producing his own movies. Incidentally, he's the director, cinematographer, and producer for today's film. And he even started a production company with Infernal Affairs as its first product. It's safe to say that this movie was Lau's baby, but then babies usually have more than one parent. Andrew Lau's collaborator and co-director was Alan Mack. While this was their first collaboration, it would not be their last. Alan Mack is about half a decade younger than Lau, and he'd been directing for only five years when Infernal Affairs came out, but he got the director's seat because he, along with writer Felix Chung, wrote the script that became Infernal Affairs. They went to Andrew Lau, he thought it would be a great fit for his new production company, and off they went. Infernal Affairs features a star-studded cast, which is something else it has in common with Departed. To be perfectly honest, though, I'm kind of lost when it comes to the names on this list, since I'm not exactly the world's biggest Hong Kong cinema expert. But I won't let that stop me from listing off the actors. The undercover officer is played by Tony Lung, one of the biggest names in Asian cinema, period, and a co-star in movies you may have heard of, like 2002's Hero and 1992's Hard Boiled. The second protagonist is Andy Lau, another big name, who acted in over a hundred films between 1985 and 2005. And he still had enough time to spare to become a famous pop singer. Then there's Anthony Wong, a half-English actor who plays the police superintendent, but was a triad boss in Hard Boiled. The triad boss in this film is Eric Tsang, a man who is less famous for being an actor and more for being a TV personality. And while I don't know enough about their careers to say this for certain, I'm pretty sure that both Wong and Tsang were cast against type for this movie. Ah, but why talk about the actors when I could talk about their performances in... The Story. The movie begins by panning over broken Buddhist statues, because the Chinese title is a reference to Buddhism's lowest layer of hell, known as Avicii, or Continuous Hell. Because unlike the other layers of hell, you can never escape Avicii. The name is also why the English title is a pun, Infernal Affairs. The movie itself begins in a Buddhist temple, 
Han San is reminiscing to some young gangsters about his triad's rocky start and how it made him a religious man. He's sending the seven gangsters to be moles in the Hong Kong police force since their affiliations aren't known yet, and their lineup includes Lao Kin Ming, one of our protagonists. Meanwhile, the police have decided to make Chan Wing Yan an undercover cop, so they make a show of kicking him out of the police academy. Now that the setup is complete, the story begins in a stereo shop. Chan, the cop, works at the store between gang jobs, and Lao, the triad mole, is his customer. They bond for a bit over some music. Chan then heads to a rooftop to talk to his police handler, Superintendent Wong Chi Sing. And yes, both Wong and Lao's actors have the same last name as their characters. Go figure. Wong wants Chan to get some therapy since he started assaulting people and he's getting too much into his role. But Chan complains that that's because his three-year undercover job has extended to ten years. And unfortunately, Wong can't let him go because Chan is the best-placed undercover cop they've got. He's also in a tenuous position in the force, since the only other guy who knew Chan was a cop just died. Over at the station, Lau is a senior investigator with the police. For his introduction, he pretends to be a lawyer for a criminal and tricks him into giving Lau an emergency number for a brother Mo. He and his team then get pulled into a sting operation between Han's gang and some Thai drug runners based on information that Chan gave his handler. So naturally, Lau warns Han, but Han tells him it's too late to cancel. So the Thais come to the meeting with a cocaine sample smuggled in a cigar, Chan tests the drugs and gives them his approval, and Han, rather jovially, makes the deal. Things get tense as both moles relay information to keep their side one step ahead. Chan taps on a window he bugged in Morse code to tell the cops the deal location, but then Lao hacks his own computer to warn Han that he has a mole and needs to abort. Han's men get rid of the drugs fast enough to avoid arrest, but now both Han and Wong know they have a mole, and neither of them is happy. Han tells Lao to find the mole in his triad, so Lao asks him to send over information about the gangsters who were part of the deal. And at the same time, the police are putting him in charge of finding their mole, since they think he is above suspicion. And instead of investigating from his end, Chan is laying low so he won't get caught. He's also sleeping through several months of therapy sessions, at least when he isn't flirting with a the therapist. Han makes his men fill out the information that Lao requested, and he hands it off to him in a dark movie theater. But Chan followed them there. When he doesn't get a good look at Lao, he does follow him out. Then Chan almost gets caught when Han calls him, and so neither of them identify each other. Chan then visits Han, and he gets the same I trust you most of all speech that Lao did, although in his case he is not above suspicion. Looking up the gangster's info doesn't work, so instead, Lao gets his internal affairs team to tail Superintendent Wong on the pretense that he's under investigation. So when Wong goes to the rooftop meeting place, Lao calls Han, and then rushes out himself when the IA tail spots Han's hit squad. One of Han's men end up warning Chan, so he escapes on the window washer's platform, while Wong covers for him by trying to take the elevator. Unfortunately, that ends with Wong taking the fast way down and landing on Chan's taxi, which means that no one knows that Chan is really undercover. And as a sad song plays, the cops and gangsters open fire on each other. The gangster who helps Chan get away starts talking about how he doesn't like violence and how he didn't tell Han that Chan left a few minutes before the confrontation. And then he drives off the road because he got hit during the shootout and he's bleeding to death. It's actually a really good scene. Back with Lao, the senior officers have found out Wong had an undercover with Han's gang, but the file is encrypted and password protected. At the same time, seeing Wong die is making Lao seriously reconsider his loyalties. And just to complicate things further, Lao realizes that he can use Wong's phone to contact the undercover agent. He first taps something out in Morse code, and when Chan calls back, he offers to get the officer out of his assignment. But Chan says he has unfinished business, and Lao agrees to help, provided they stay within the law. 
The media report that the dead driver was an undercover cop, and Chan takes credit for killing him. He recommends Han visit his drug warehouse in case the information got leaked, but it's really so Chan can relay the location using more Morse code. This time, the sting goes off perfectly, and while Han manages to get away on foot, Lao tracks him down personally and shoots him to make his change in loyalties permanent. When Lao gets back to the precinct, he gets a standing ovation, and Chan is there waiting for him. It seems like everything's wrapping up nicely, but as Lao accesses Chan's file, Chan goes through his stuff and notices the envelope with the gangster documents, which Chan had marked earlier. This proves Lao was Han's mole, and even if he did help with the sting, Chan is not about to forgive Lao for Wong's death. He leaves, and when Lao realizes why he left, he deletes Chan's undercover record in retaliation. Chan spends the night with Li, the psychiatrist he'd been flirting with, and the next day, he goes to the house Lao shares with his fiance. Under the pretense of working for the electronics store, he tunes up their radio and leaves a CD. A CD the fiancé listened to. A CD which has a copy of a recording Han made of a phone call with Lao. Turns out, Han recorded all his conversations to use as insurance. A fact I glazed over, but the film carefully established earlier. Chan wants to make a trade. He gets his life back and Lao keeps his reputation. They meet on the rooftop, and Chan gets the jump on Lao. Lao tells Chan he's going straight, but he can't restore Chan's record. So Chan says, that's fine, I'll just hand over my evidence, and we'll let the court sort things out. But then another officer shows up. So Chan holds Lao at gunpoint and takes the elevator down so they can all get arrested by the police. But then, the officer takes the shot and kills Chan. Turns out he's another of Han's moles, and he shot Chan and erased Han's tapes to protect them both. But on the elevator ride down, Lao shoots the inspector dead. This turns out to be the wisest move, because months later, Dr. Lee discovers evidence that proves Chan was an officer all along, and the dead inspector takes the fall for being Han's mole in the police force. And as we zoom out from Chan's funeral, the movie ends. The style. First things first, I've got to be honest with you guys, I have never watched The Departed. I hear it's really good and it has a star-studded cast, but that's basically all I know. But hey, silver lining. Since I haven't seen The Departed, I can approach Infernal Affairs in a vacuum, on its own merits. And I have to say, even though I don't speak a word of Cantonese, I can tell that this was a really good movie and a perfect example of the thriller genre. That's why I broke out the style title card. Once again, I'm using the genre definition of style so I can talk about what makes a work a thriller. Sadly, thriller is kind of hard to define, and it's for the same reason that film noir is hard to define. Both seek to invoke a certain mood or emotion in the audience, so there's nothing concrete in the film you can point to as proof that it's a thriller. And like how noir overlaps with other genres, like dramas and crime films, thrillers overlap with other genres, like dramas and crime films. Except the mood is different in a thriller. Sometimes. I've told you guys before how I think that using genres to do anything but suggest new works is bullshit, right? Because genre elitism is bullshit. Anyway, the key to understanding whether something is a thriller is that word. Thrill. As in thrill ride. The kind of ride that pushes you into the back of your seat as it throws you up and down, through loops and curves and helices. Experiencing a thriller, whether in book or movie format, should be like going on an emotional roller coaster. There are moments when the action slows down, but it's only to build up suspense and tension. Suspense that unleashes when everything goes downhill really fast, and only seems to recover at the very last second. And in the end, it only leads up to the next big hill. Let me use Hitchcock's Psycho as an example, because Psycho is a perfect case study of the thriller roller coaster. You start with the premise. Marion Crane needs money so she can get married, 
and a guy with more money than he can spend hands her an envelope full of cash and acts like a bit of an asshole, so instead of going to the bank, she takes the money and drives off. Already we're climbing the first hill. We're sympathizing with Marion despite her illegal actions, and we know she's doing something extremely risky. And then the tension mounts as her boss walks past her car on the way out of town. The movie hits a new hurdle when a highway patrolman wakes Marion up and questions her, and tension mounts again as she acts nervous and the patrolman starts following her. So she trades in her car for cash and evades the officer. When Marion stops at the Bates Motel, it's raining hard and everything seems a little creepy, a little unearthly. But Norman Bates is so disarmingly awkward and forthright that the audience calms down. But then we start to learn some more things about Norman to put a creepy tinge on his awkwardness. And yet, because of Norman, Marion decides to come clean and return to Phoenix, boosting audience sympathy right before the movie throws us a tremendous curveball by having a shadowy figure murder the protagonist after a long and very quiet scene. After that, lead roles go to Marion's boyfriend, Sam, and her sister, Lila. We also meet Milton Arbogast, private investigator, and we follow him for long enough to know that he's a reasonable man, hard worker, and good enough at his job that he not only narrowed the suspects to Norman Bates, he also told Lila and Sam where he was going. So while on some level the audience expects Arbogast to die, we're attached enough to him to not want it to happen. And the entirely different camera angles of the second murder catch us completely off guard. Then we get thrown for another loop when the sheriff says that Norman's mother is dead. Suspense builds again as our two surviving protagonists explore the Bates home while evading Norman, and then the final twist. Norman killed his mother, and out of grief, he now takes on her personality to kill female guests. There's enough of a denouement to explain what the hell just happened, and then it ends. But did you notice how I mentioned that Psycho built up audience sympathy before doing something tragic to the characters? Because that is a key feature of thrillers that often gets overlooked. Character depth and audience sympathy are just as important as tricky plots. You do need tricky and twisty plots, where no one is safe and it's hard to tell what'll happen next, if you want to keep suspense high, but you also need sympathetic protagonists and antagonists, so that the audience will care when something terrible happens, and so they'll understand why characters betray each other. And that's true even if the person they're betraying is the bad guy. Infernal Affairs manages this character aspect perfectly, and it's definitely worth watching, whether or not you've seen The Departed. Thanks for joining me again for today's film review. I hope I'll see you next time for a modern kung fu comedy that features axe gangs, Shanghai slums, and the Buddhist palm.